Heavenly Father, thank you for your, your word to us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that it is in season all the time. Thank you, Lord God, that as we come to your word, we know that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide us and help us to understand these eternal truths, these truths that were there from before the, 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 the dawn of time. Your word has always been true. And Lord, as we come to you today, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us and meet with us Lord, we are so in need to hear from you, especially in, in the times in which we live, the times in which we find ourselves. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would help us and give us the understanding we need today, Lord. Lord, whether we are far or near, like the people on Mars Hill, those philosophers of the age, Lord, some are close, some are far, but Lord, you are always near to us, Lord. And so, Lord God, as we... As we come before you today, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us and help us. Lord, each person that you've brought you and everyone listening online, and watching online, Lord, we know, Lord, that they are loved by you, that they are cherished by you, Lord God, and that, Lord, you have a plan for their lives and you are working in their hearts. And so uh, bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we, we began the book of, uh, in the book of Hebrews on chapter 11, and um, now, faith is confidence in which we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And we're looking at what faith is. What does faith mean? We talk about it all the time. We assume we know what we're all talking about. And uh, I don't want to, don't, do not want to assume that we all understand what faith is because the word has gone through a lot of abuse. And, um, and we talk about, uh, you know, if you've got faith and you can do all kinds of things, and, and it's often been abused and misused, uh, that word uh, faith, uh, by, particularly within Christian circles, within, uh, by the so-called faith movement that has so distorted the meaning of that word. And yeah, in Hebrews, it gives us the definition. So we're all on the same page. Faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so we've seen, and I just want to briefly, because it really does help us to carry on in the book, I need to just give a little recap, is that it is a confidence, confident assurance to know that something exists, that something is true. It is a gift from God. We know that it is faith. God, it is a spiritual gift from God, and it is, I like to think of it as a spiritual sense where we see things and we can believe things that we otherwise could not with our eyes or our ears or our touch or our taste or smell, we can experience our world and know certain things exist. I don't doubt that this pulpit exists because you can see it and you can feel it. Uh, if I knock on it, you can hear it. You could taste it if you want, but I wouldn't advise that. But uh, we can experience, we know this pulpit is here. Now, faith allows us, gives us a sense to know things that we otherwise could not know and experience we have no other way to experience and know that spiritual things are real or true except by the faith that God gives us. He has given us this awareness. And so we believe the many promises in the word of God by faith. And we obey the instructions in the word by faith. We believe by conviction the word of God in its entirety is true by faith even though we might have no other way to prove certain things in the Bible. It's fascinating if you ever indulge yourself in, in a biblical archaeology. It is a fascinating subject. The things that are constantly being unearthed that prove things that, for, that in other ways have never been able to be proven. For example, Baruch, that is mentioned in the Old Testament as a scribe. They had no way of knowing that until not so long recently they discovered a seal of, of parchments that, that had been burnt uh, in Jerusalem, and they discovered the seal with the name Baruch on it, who otherwise could never be proved. Now, it's great when that happens, isn't it? We can say, there you see the Bible is true, because here's a person that Isaiah speaks about, and the, or the prophets speak about, as having been the scribe, 
and we had no way of knowing this person exists. And suddenly, yeah, we've got physical evidence. You can go and see the seal in a, online, or, or you can go and even visit a museum and, and see it there. But there's so much we can't prove, and we have to simply believe by faith and God, this God-given gift that we believe every word, and we trust and we obey the word of God. Now, faith gives us all the evidence we need to believe in Jesus Christ and to live our lives by the word of God. And so, as Hebrews says, faith is that confident hope, confident hope regarding future things, things that have yet to be fulfilled. And it is the evidence, it gives us the evidence, the tangible evidence in a spiritual sense of unseen present reality. So future and present, that's what faith gives us. All that we need to believe and trust the Lord for all things in every situation, without fear or doubts. Now it's important that faith, and I didn't stress this much last week, but I, I wanted to, but we didn't have the time. And I didn't, yeah, we, so, so we kind of just I alluded to it, but how faith is made visible in the life of believers. Uh, and, and when we live out, faith is something that can't be seen until we start living it out, isn't it? That's how you see faith. Like light that is a thing that is actually invisible. Light itself is invisible until it hits something, until it strikes an object. Then you, you would say, I see light. I see the light. It's something you've, it's, you don't see light. You actually see the thing that the light is, uh, is the light particles are, are, uh, are striking against. And so, yeah, light is invisible until it hits something. Faith is invisible until it is lived out by us. When we start living by faith, people see it and they say, well, that person really has faith, don't they? Well, they'll talk about seeing faith in the life of a person. That is our witness. That is our testimony. People see Jesus in us. Your faith in Jesus is seen by others and hopefully others will come to faith when they see the faith that is lived out in you. Now, Hebrews 11 is loaded with people who had faith and exercised it, and we were able to see it in tangible, real people. And then we see and know what is real and what faith looks like. And so this morning is all about the faith of the faithful. Faith of the faithful, if you want to make a heading in your, in your notes. We're going to look at verses 11 down through to it's chapter 11 and verses 8, down, right down to verse 23. Let me read for us. It says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, for he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country not their own, not of their own, uh, looking for a country of their own, sorry, rather, uh, if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reckoned that God could have raised, even raised the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Let's pause there. Let's use, let's, let's 
uh, uh, stop there and take that far this, this morning. Quite a long reading, but a, a lot for us to get through this morning. The first thing we see in this passage, in verse 8, is Abraham's faith of obedience. You know what? Think of it as obedience as faith, or the faith of, of Abraham's obedience. That is, that we see that faith is an act of obedience. We can only obey by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed, we're told, when he was called to go. You must go. And Abraham obeyed. He went without knowing where he was going. Not in the sense it says that it, not in the sense as many of you know when you when you're driving with your with your with your partner that they lost and they won't admit that they lost. They don't know where they're going. It's, that's not what Abraham's problem was here. Abraham knew where he was going, but he didn't know where he was going. He wasn't lost in that sense. God had told him where to go, but he didn't know in the sense of what wait, awaited him there and what this place was like. He obeyed and he went, showing a conscious willingness to go, first of all, and an action together. He obeyed and he, he went. The two went together. You see, obedience must come from a heart's desire, a willingness uh, to do, to, to do good, to do right by God. There is, a, there is a heart action that needs to change, right? There's a, I want to do something this way, but I uh, obeyed and went. I, I First, I had to deal with my heart issue, my heart struggle, the rebellion in my heart to do things my way and say, that's not God's way. I need to find that, and I need to do what God tells me to do and then actually do what God told me to do. But it all starts in the heart and the mind, doesn't it? That's, I think that I know that's the right thing to do. Then there's that willingness to come in in the heart as we talk about our hearts, our emotions, our feelings, uh, to do that, that willingness to do what I know is right. You see, we're not robots we don't obey mechanically because uh, God, God said so. There, has, there is a wrestling that takes place uh, that we have to wrestle. This is what God has said, a, a desire to do the will of God. And so a willingness that comes in the heart must, though, also prove itself by action and by the things that we do. It's a, it's a double barrel thing. Jesus said, don't say, I will go, and then don't go. Rather say, I won't go, and then go. In uh, Matthew 21, verse, verse 30. And James likewise talks much about this. He says, faith by itself, in chapter 2, verse 17 of James, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And in chapter 4, verse 17 of James, if anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And so we know in our minds that's the right thing to do. In our hearts, I want to do the right thing. And then we actually have to do the right thing, all right? And that's what it's, we see here in Abraham's uh, obedience. God, we know, will not ask you to do the impossible beyond what you can bear. Some will do what God says and what's right only when it seems beneficial to themselves, only when it holds some immediate reward or some immediate benefit or they can see the gratification in doing the will of God, when it's convenient, when it... When it feels like the right thing to do, then they will, will do it. When it's convenient, when it's good for them, when it's a popular decision or an easy decision to make. Right remains right regardless of time, regardless of culture. Uh, sex before marriage is still wrong. It's not a 1960s idea. It is in the word of God. And we know it's, a, it's, it's an act of obedience. There has to be a willingness to do it and then an actual doing of it, doing the right thing. And that is, you see, when, we, when we'll only obey God when it feels good for us, when it works for us, so to speak, and we don't try and justify the wrong that we're doing, we say, I know it's the right thing, I need to stop it and do it, uh, do the right thing. You see, if we only do it when it's convenient, that is really not faithful obedience at all. Faith enables us to obey the word of God even when there is no immediate apparent benefit, as in the case of Abraham. He didn't know where he was going. Couldn't see the benefit, the immediate benefit of going. It may even mean the opposite. It may mean great costs. Leave your family, leave your land, leave all the safety and the security and the things that you have. Leave it behind and go to the place I'm showing you. It may come with great inconvenience and no immediate reward to us. 
We're told, he's told to leave his country and his people and his father's house. Where Abraham was sent would only later be received as an inheritance. In fact, not even by himself. He was going to leave the permanence of where he was staying and go and live in tents where they were going to be going. But his descendants would inherit that land. And so it's delayed gratification, delayed pleasure, delayed security, all of that for Abraham. So it's a huge sacrifice that he was making. And within our natural selves, we, we want instant satisfaction, don't we? We want instant reward. This, this idea of, of waiting for something, you know, we, we've become so impatient where everything is just so like this. We just jump on a plane and the next thing we're in a different country across the globe. Imagine if we had to get on a ship and travel for a few months to just go and visit the grandchildren. You know, imagine that. We've we just become so used to things here and now and quick and easy. Abraham, it was long-term, and there was a waiting in this faith, a waiting in the obedience, waiting for the reward to come. What's also important about this, and you'll see it coming out again and again, we were talking about this before the service, what's so important about this, and every example of faith, the people's faith in the Bible, that we have is the imperfection of their faith. The imperfection, that these are real people. You see, Abraham's faith, if you just read Hebrews 11, you'd think, and you could probably run through all of these people, if you just read Hebrews 11, you'd think, these are the heroes of the faith. These people were perfect. Their faith was beyond any shadow, without any doubt, without any question. And yet when you actually go and read the original stories of the things these people did, you'll be quite shocked. You'll blush with some of the things these people got up to. Abraham's faith was not immediate. It was not complete. He only went halfway. Actually, in my notes, I originally wrote, he left. When I I, I, I deleted it, uh, but uh, he left without without any hesitation. And I went back and read the story. I'm like, actually, no, he didn't leave without any hesitation. You know, we want to think that, right? He just dropped everything and went like he should have. No, he didn't. There were all kinds of things he did first. He only went halfway. At first and later, he went to where he was actually told to go in the first place. But God was gracious to him and considered it faith, not perfection. Sometimes we confuse faith with perfection. He's a man of faith because he's perfect, right? But yet we see the examples of people again and again and again and just run the list. Every one of them, you can see there were faults in their lives. If you really dig deeper, there were real people with real struggles like us, ordinary people like us, right? They were not perfect, but they were faithful. Secondly, we see in verses 9 and 10, Abraham's faith in the promises of God. So the first point is about the fact that faith is obedience. Faith enables us to be obedient. And by being obedient, we show the faith that we have in God's word. But we also see Abraham's faith in the promises of God, verses 9 and 10. This promise is something that you hope for to be received, or sometimes we've received already that promise, and we say this is a promise, but it's a fulfilled promise. Abraham eventually gets to the promised land, and he lives there as a stranger and a foreigner, we're told. He didn't inherit the land as, as shown by the fact that he lived in a tent, uh, nothing permanent. There were squatters in the land, foreigners and aliens in the land, along with the next generation, even Isaac, even Jacob. The three great patriarchs were campers. They were, they were living in the land. as uh, They were camping there. Uh, they, they didn't own land except for a very small plot of land in Hebron. And uh, you can still go and see that. You can still visit Hebron and uh, you'll find the four graves of, of um Abraham and Isaac and their wives there. It's in a mosque today, and you can actually go and see the graves of these people there. They were content to do so, to live in tents, because they had faith in the promised hope of a better place. They were looking for something better. As he describes it, they're a city with foundations and whose architect and builder is God. You see, the contrast is intentional. Living in a tent or in a city built by God. I love camping. My wife doesn't. 
came out in our premarital counseling. I wasn't actually sure if I should marry her because I, I had this idea of a Land Rover with a tent on the roof, driving, exploring Africa. And it came out in our premarital counseling. My wife was like, what? Absolutely not. I'm living in a brick building. I'm not, we're not camping like that. We're not going to do that. Got all the kit and all the equipment, but sitting there gathering dust. Because, you know, her reasoning is, why well, live in a tent when you could stay in a five-star hotel, penthouse, you know? That's the goal, and we haven't done that yet, but uh, maybe one day. <laughs> you know, why, why would you want that? With all the food and amenities, where there's just no comparison. Yeah, camping is nice, but it's just not the same, right, as a, as a hotel. You see, sometimes we can get too caught up in the tents and the things of this life and are distracted, striving for for bigger and better tents, bigger and better chariots and the things, forgetting that this life and this world is not our permanent home. We store up for ourselves treasures on this earth like it's this is it, this is the final place. But it's not, and they remembered that. They believed the promises of God of a better place than even the best that this world has to offer. Mark 4, 18 warns us, Jesus warns us about where the seed talks about the seed sown among thorns that they hear the word, the kind of people who hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So many of us are caught up in that. Now, faith enables us to see past the now to the then, to what's coming, to the promises, to the hope that is ours, and to believe the promises of God and know that a better, perfect, permanent city of God awaits us. A new Jerusalem described in Revelation 21 and 22. We have keys to Zion City, as we sang about. We have keys to heaven. Where is your home? What is it that you're working towards? Thirdly, we see Sarah's faith in God's faithfulness. Verse 11 and 12. Sarah was 90. If you go and read the story in Genesis 17, 17, she was 90 when God promised a son. I'm not going to go into the birds and the bees here, but it is just humanly not possible for a person to conceive at the age of 90. It's just beyond human capability, human possibility. She was past the age of childbearing. In case you're not sure about that, the Bible actually says that. Just in case you, you're doubting it. it, she was beyond that. Uh, But God enabled her to conceive and in that give birth to a child through whom God would build a nation. Not because of her faithfulness, but because of her faith in the faithfulness of God and his promises. And that's why she's mentioned here. Because she believed in the faithfulness of God to fulfill what he said. In fact, if you hear the story and go and read the story in Genesis 17... What did she do when she heard the word that she's going to be praying, this poor old 90-year-old pensioner who should have been, you know, on a rocking chair somewhere? She laughed, like some of you are now. She laughed. Imagine that for some of you, having a child at your age. She was 90, and she laughed when she heard that they would give birth to a child, and she needed the assurances from God and from the Lord that it can be. In Genesis 18, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord, it says? Sarah was afraid, and here it is. She lied. She was a liar as well. She doubted, she lied, she laughed at the Lord, she lied. And then she goes and says to the Lord, I didn't laugh. And the Lord says, you did. This is Sarah. Again, we see the imperfection of her faith, don't we? We see the imperfection of this woman. She was human, and she, she responded as she did. So, so it's so good for us to see and to acknowledge the humanity of these people. Not to lessen them or to doubt them, and so, to doubt them, but to realize that our faith is not in these people or in people we might know even in our church or in our, in our circles of people. But to see the grace and the faithfulness of God, that is where our faith sits secure. It's not your faith. It is a gift from God. It is not your faithfulness, but God's faithfulness that opens the hand, his hand of blessing. This old barren woman conceived a son and gave birth to a nation. Too great to count, it says. God gave her strength to conceive. And because he is faithful to his promises, God did what he said. He did the impossible. Is anything too hard for me? Absolutely not. 
and he showed that to her. And by faith, she was enabled to conceive. Fourthly, we see God's people wait in faith. Verses 13 through to 16. Now, at this point, Hebrews pans out a little bit to speak about all these people mentioned and how they were living by faith when they died. Apparently, shockingly, it says, verse 13, they did not receive the things promised. And God, did God fail to deliver? Did God, is God not true to his promises? That's, that's what it says there, that, he, that they, they did not receive what was promised even when they, when they died. By faith, we believe in the promises of God, as did they. But we recognize that the time of the fulfillment of those promises is really in the Lord's hands. We have received many of the promises that God has made in his word, and that of those early believers did, uh, and some of them they did not. The things we've received, they looked forward to the Messiah. We, We have. They could only look forward to that. We have received the promised Messiah. Jesus is, greatest, is our greatest promise that has been fulfilled in God. But there are promises in the word that God is still going to fulfill that we too must wait for. His promised return, for example. And like them, we live as foreigners on earth, intense, in, so to speak. They, the delay is not a crisis for us. We may die before the Lord returns. By faith, we believe and we patiently wait for his coming. It's one of those unfulfilled promises that we are looking forward to. And it is faith that enables us to patiently wait for the Lord to do what he has said, and he will do it. Maybe in our lifetime, but maybe as in the case of these people we read about in the Bible, it wasn't in their lifetime. It was yet to be fulfilled, but they believed it possible anyway. Even if it takes a whole lifestyle, and even if we don't see it in this life, we know that we will see the Lord, and we want to be ready for that day, and we do not turn back and go back to where we came. We are longing for a permanent, a better home, our heavenly home with the Lord as his people, and he as our God, and we welcome the promises from afar. Soon we will be at home. Now, if you've had that experience when you're coming from Johannesburg, you've been driving for hours. You've ever done that drive, and you just it just goes on and on. That road just keeps going and going and going. Eventually, when you go through the Uganda Tunnel, you know we're nearly there, and then the road just seems to keep on and on and on. It takes forever, and then you come over you know, on the N1, and you just come over that hill, and you just see the ocean, and you see the ships in the harbor, and you know, ah, oh, it's home. And you can look across the, the flats, and you can see the mountain here, yeah, and you know, Yes, there there it is. That's where we're going. And you are happy, but from afar. And that's what they were doing. They were looking from afar. They believed that they could see it, but they weren't quite there yet. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Living like this shows where our loyalty lies, where we believe our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And although we might be rejected for his word, God will not reject us. From him we receive full acceptance. God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them as he has prepared a city for us. Knowing this gives us great strength to endure when we are tempted, when we are discouraged in our faith. It gives us courage and strength to keep on going. You you can stop right there on the other side of Cape Town and sit there and look from afar. You can maybe even turn back and say, it's just been so far. Let's just go back to where we've come from. But no, we can see home. We know where where our home lies. Knowing this gives us strength to endure the trials and the temptations that we face in life, to see them for what they are, recognizing this is not the final destination. We are waiting to go home. Fifthly, we see Abraham's test of faith that is mentioned here, verses 17 to 19. You can read the whole story in Genesis 22, verse 1 to 10. And here the integrity of Abraham's faith was tested by God. God, who is all-knowing, the test was there not to show God Abraham's faith, 
but to show Abraham Abraham's faith, right? And God's faithfulness. It was a teaching moment. God knew the heart of Abraham. God knew the faithfulness or the lack of faithfulness on Abraham's part. So when it says God tested him, and, God, and it was a testing, when he was called upon to, to sacrifice his promised son, Isaac, his one and only son, God was showing Isaac, so, sorry, Abraham his faith, and Isaac for that matter. Even Isaac said, uh, Dad, uh, where, where's the sacrifice? You, know, you can kind of hear his words. And, and what does Abraham say to his son? The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Obviously, Isaac didn't know the, the events of that day. It had been shown to Isaac. It had been shown uh, to his father, Abraham, though. Abraham, by faith, believed in God and the promised descendants through him and believed that even if he did sacrifice Isaac, even if he, he and, and which involved his death, of course, uh, even if he did sacrifice Isaac, that God could raise him from the dead. He was willing to make the sacrifice. He was in the process even of doing it, knowing that God is faithful and able to fulfill his promise. And so the test sets a pattern by which Abraham was willing to give his son and God, as God gave his son for us in Jesus Christ, who was sacrificed for the forgiveness of our sins. And as God provided Abraham with a ram that was, was, was stuck in some thorn, a thorn bush, and, said, and, and, he, and he could sacrifice the, the ram instead of his son, as God provided Abraham a ram to sacrifice in the place of his son Isaac, God did not spare, however, his own son but gave him as a substitute to stand in our place and to die on our behalf to make atonement for our sins. God promised, and, he, the, and, and, and the command seemed to clash. The promises of God and the command through the Son, the nations, and yet sacrifice the Son. This, it seemed as if God's promise and his commands seemed to clash, but by faith Abraham passed the test to see the hand of God at work to bring about his purposes. My friend, you obey God's commands and let him take care of the promises. Don't you try and facilitate the promises on God's behalf. Let God be sovereign. Let God do what God does. We simply need to obey. There may, there may be difficulties in that for us in our faith and a testing of our faith, but there should be no conflicting faith. Your faith and your confidence will grow as you see the Lord fulfill his promises. And lastly, we see the faith of the descendants in verses 20 to 21. Uh, Genesis 27, uh, I, we, you can read the whole story there. Obviously, you can understand we couldn't go into all the, the stories, but you can go home and read the cross-references and the, what you read in Genesis, the full stories. This is just the, the shortened, proceed version of the, of the events that took place in Genesis. But Genesis 27 Isaac intended to bless Esau, right? Why? A number of reasons. Esau was the firstborn. That's what you do. The firstborn gets the inheritance. Uh, you know, he wasn't thinking about the things of God. Yeah, he was thinking this is the custom. This is how it's done. It's cultural. Uh, this is the thing to do. Let me bless my son Esau. And let's face it, Esau was a man's man, right? He was hairy. He was rugged. He was a hunter. He was the guy, man. He was the, you know, he was like a man's man. He, but I, and, and, and of course, the, his, his father saw that and went to, uh, 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 he went to bless him. He's the right guy to bless, right? And his thinking, well, Jacob was the, the homeboy. Uh, he was mom's boy. He was the younger one. He was not the first choice. He was his mom's first choice, not dad's first choice. But sometimes moms know stuff that dads don't know, isn't it? That's, that's true. We see that often. But Jacob was God's chosen man through whom he would work to build and God would work to build to save his people. God's blessing had to go to, to Jacob and not to Esau as was the custom and the traditions and, and the logic of, of, his, of his father. But we know that God doesn't look at the outward appearances of man, but he looks at the hearts. And he is sovereign and he sovereignly intervenes to switch the blessing from Esau to Jacob, as God has, had intended it. And Isaac, by faith, had to accept that, had to change his mind. He had to switch it, knowing it was the will of God for it to be like this. 
even when he became aware that he had been tricked by, by Jacob and his, and his mother. He said, no, this is how it has to be. This is how God has, has brought it about. God is sovereign. And he accepted that. You see, Jacob was too, was, was far from being a perfect man. As we know, he was a deceiver. He was a dishonest man. But he graciously was used by God despite his flaws. He blessed each of his grandsons, uh, uh, Isaac did, uh, each of his, of his grandsons and, uh, and the sons of Joseph uh, had to lean on, he had to lean on his staff because he had wrestled with God and he was left with a limp. His blessings and the blessings of his, of his grandsons about the future when he was dying showed that, and it gives us hope and encouragement that he finished well. Uh, he demonstrated his faith in God right to the end to do what he said. And so he blesses his grandchildren, blessing them who would become the 12 tribes of Israel and used by God for his purposes. And so as we close off this morning, we must know it's, it's not how we start out and how we start the faith that is as important as how we finish the race. Likewise, the failures along the way do not define the outcome of our lives, but through the grace and the forgiveness of God, we have faith in him to run the race and to finish the race well. God is working out his purposes, and he's working out his ways in us and through us to those who live by faith. I hope God's word is an encouragement to you this morning. Maybe you've come here a little bit discouraged, a little bit disappointed with yourself and your failures and the things you've done and said in the week or up until now, just your life in general. Remember, God is the faithful one, the only truly faithful one. Our faith is in him, and our faith is a gift that comes from God. In him we trust, and by his grace we stand. And so as we, we bow our heads this morning and as we pray, we think to God and his faithfulness, not our faithfulness, but despite our unfaithfulness, how faithful is our God. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word to us this morning. Your grace and your compassion, Lord, to us, Lord. Even as we've looked at these, these great heroes of the faith, just some of them mentioned in Hebrews 11, there are many more in the scriptures. And yet, Lord, if we, if we go looking, we can see their faults and their failings, and we can criticize them and, and point out their flaws and, and all their many failings, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that despite those things, you use these people. Even they mention in Hebrews 11 as people who did things by faith, showing us what true faith really looks like. Lord, today as we sit here, we are so mindful, Lord, of your grace and your mercy that is at work, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that though our faith is not what it should be, it's also not what it could be. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would strengthen us in the faith, as you the one who grants us faith to believe in things which we otherwise cannot know and cannot see. But by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you would grant us much faith to believe, to stand the tests, to work through the trials and the tribulations we go through, to resist the temptations that come our way, that we might live as obedient children of God who are waiting for the promised return of our Lord who are mindful that one day we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have to give an account for our lives. That we believe by faith, Lord. And so, Lord, help us, Lord, we pray, to do better for your sake, for your name's sake, to demonstrate to others around us what true faith looks like, Lord, the grace and the mercy of it all and the obedience of it too, Lord. And so, Lord, for each one here today, Lord, I pray today that you would grant us much faith to do your will, to live our lives for you, to bring honor and glory to your name. By the grace of God, we can pray this, and by faith we believe it is possible. And so help us, Lord, we pray, to do your will and to live for you in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.